Welcome. Welcome everyone to, to PCB West 2013, Session 9, Switching Power Supplies. My name is, I'm your speaker. My name is Scott Nance. I'm a senior printed circuit designer at Optimum Design Associates. I've been a PCB designer in the service bureau industry for 30 years. Uh, I'd like to point out that I'm not an electrical engineer nor a power supply designer, so this presentation is from my perspective and that is that of a printed circuit designer. So, um, the reason for this presentation I think is kind of simple. Switching power supplies and their layouts are everywhere. We see them in simple designs, tough designs, uh, cheap consumer products in your high-end uh, phones. We see them throughout our computer uh, supplying the power and uh, all throughout the computer at point of loads. So uh, that's the reason for the presentation. Uh, the reason that I'm here is that we, uh, we were, it was suggested by my boss that we, uh, we each take an article to write, and mine was switching power supplies. And uh, I invite you to look at some other articles that were written by other designers from Optimum Design. You can find them at designinthetrenches.com. And they are, uh, they're covering topics like DDR timing, uh, uh, rational silkscreen, Valor NPI, uh, ODB++, um, and several others. So you can see uh, abstracts of these articles at, again, designinthetrenches.com. Um, we, we see that there's uh, tons of, of available information about switching power supplies for the electrical engineer. Uh, volumes about magnetics and power loss, but there's, uh, there's not as uh, much good information for the PCB layout uh, professional. And uh, I, I think this, this, this presentation might help clear up some of the uh, confusions that PCB designers have when it comes time for a switching power supply. Um, we need to be able to identify it and be able to lay it out so that each uh, layout acts and, intent and is, and is uh, it, it works as the manufacturer intended. And so uh, I intend to briefly tell the history of switching power supplies. We won't spend too much time there. Um, and then explain how they work. And then I'm going to provide some specific layout techniques and examples, um, some do's and don'ts. And then uh, all this is just meant to provide the layout professional with enough information that he uh, becomes empowered to become a better member of his design team. So uh, let's begin. The, the agenda, first of all, switching power supplies. What are they? What do they look like? How do we identify them? How do they work? And then we'll get into the PCB layout. And that'll be probably more fun. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that as soon as we can. And then if we have time, we have some power supply basics to review. And at any time, if anyone has any questions or anything's unclear, please feel free to ask questions. And uh, we'll see if we can get to them in the time allotted. So again, switching power supply history. Uh, this is going to be a short just recap on where they've been. Not where they're going, but just a short where, they've been, where they have been, where they came from. And then we're going to go over some supply types and topologies so you can identify them. Uh, as a PCB layout professional, it might not be as, as important to know these things because most of these uh, decisions have been made before they ever get into layout. The engineer's already decided all the parameters for the switching power supply. Uh, we'll get more into the meat of it when we get down into switching power supply circuitry. Uh, a little bit of the history. The, the switching power supply histories, the, the, the principles were known in, in the 1930s. They were used on condensers and arc welders and things of that nature. Uh, IBM used it in their 704 mainframe, and of course it was giant and not as efficient as the switchers that we see today. Um, NASA used them. Uh, Telstar satellite is a good example. And then the famous one is the Apple II personal computer, because the switching power supply was introduced and actually made the computer small enough and light enough that it could be used uh, in the home. So there's lots of people that want to take credit for the popularity of the switching power supply. Uh, Apple comes to mind. Rod Holt was the engineer that introduced it in the Apple II. And he, he got a lot of credit, which, which is due, but he did not invent the switching power supply. He, he only applied it to the home computer. Uh, what really should be credited with the explosion of popularity of switching power supplies are innovations in the semiconductor industry, which are going to be the controller chips that control the switching power supply and make them efficient. And the other thing was a power, it was needed that a power switch was needed to be able to quickly switch high currents. And uh, the vertical metal oxide semiconductor power transistor uh, enabled this. And that's, that's a, a fab term for vertical metal oxide semiconductor. It's the fab process for the chip, and it allowed for the quick switching. Uh, this was important for consumer 
products because at the time bipolar transistors were used for a while and they worked very well for high power applications but they didn't switch uh, in the older days nowhere near switched fast enough and what happened was the switching frequency wasn't above the audible hearing range of humans so we hear things like squeals and TVs and things like that and, and now the frequencies are much higher and they're way more efficient because of that. So a little more history, uh, these switching power supplies used to be called switch mode power supplies. Um, Motorola started enforcing their trademarks so they no longer are called that. They're called uh, variations, they're, called, they're often called switched mode, switching mode, or SMPS. Um, I like the universal term switcher because it applies to all of them and I'll be using that term from, now, from this point forward. So when, when you think of a switching power supply, the, if you're shopping for a switching power supply, what comes to mind is the computer main supply. Um, it's actually more than a switching power supply, and I'll show you in a minute, but it's, it, we call that a, a power supply unit. And that's what sources the mains voltage, the 110, and supplies all the voltages through the computer that you need. Uh, additional regulation is happening at the controller, at the graphics card, and any other place that's stepping down the, the, the voltages from the main power supply. And we call those regulators or point of load. And this is just, that's a little example of a little linear ball grid array point of load regulator. So here's some examples, just, it's, a, it's just showing a pictures of the vast difference and maybe, con, maybe adding to the confusion of what is a switching power supply. Um, the computer main power supply, a, a cell phone charger, uh, a, an adjustable laboratory grade switching power supply, uh, the linear ball grid array, which uh, looks, looks benign, but it's, it's really that one's uh, quite exotic, uh, an off-the-shelf module that you could use for, for applications that uh, w would work for off-the-shelf. And then that's a car audio 800 watt power amplifier. So here's a block diagram of the computer PSU that I was talking about. Um, as you can see, the first stages of them are really uh, preparing the voltages for the switching power supply. Uh, fuse, EMI filter, rectification. Uh, if you know about power supply, after rectification it becomes a DC voltage. So really, the switching power supply is not really converting AC into DC. It's, uh, it's taking a DC voltage. And I'll, I'll show you, it's actually converting it to an AC and then back to a DC for its output voltage for the purpose of efficiency. Uh, in this picture right here, I have, uh, after the rectifier, I have a PFC circuit, and that is in some higher end uh, PSUs, and that sounds for power factor correction. And there's two types, there's a passive and an active. And if it's an active power factor corrector circuit, it's actually another switching power supply um, in line, preparing the voltage before the main power supply. And your, your common DC voltages that you would see, your standby voltages, your plus 12, your plus 5, plus 3.3, .3, sometimes minus 12 and minus 5. So this is what we're going to be, fo we're, we're going to be talking about the PSU anymore, just the power supply, the, the switching power supply sections. So by definition, a switching power supply uses a power switch, magnetics, out, out, uh, filter caps, and a rectifier to transfer energy in it. From, and that's from an input to an output source providing a regulated voltage. And it works by rapidly turning that power switch on and off. So uh, that output voltage is calculated by what the input voltage to the switcher is and, and the duty cycle. And the duty cycle is the proportion of time that that switch is on versus off. During the on state, uh, they call it saturation mode. and um, it's an efficient state. It's got neg negligible voltage drop across it. Uh, in the off state, it's cut off, and it has no current going across it. And so the power switch stays in these two states for, for, uh, for some of the time, and, and those are very efficient states. And so during these times, they dissipate very little power. This is the theory behind the switching power supply. And of course, efficiency is usually the reason that you're using a switching power supply. Um, Linear regulators are, are typically in the 60% and, and uh, switching power supplies are, are regularly in the 90% and they're never 100% but they're, they can be 98. Higher efficiency of course means lower power drain on the input source, longer life for your batteries, lower heat buildup, all the things we need for our small um, modern day electronic devices. <coughs> 
So compar comparing them to the predecessors, which are linear regulators, switchers don't re require the large, heavy, low-frequency transformers that you would have seen in maybe the Apple I before the Apple II. They were large transformers. Switchers don't require these, but they do require high-frequency filtering. And uh, these are done with uh, a lot smaller components. So the, the filtering is done with an LC circuit. It's going to be with an inductor and a cap as opposed to a large transformer. These, these aren't dissipating as much heat. Uh, and so we, we, we see a, lot, a higher frequency, a, a higher efficiency by, by doing this. It also allows us to miniaturize. And uh, in conjunction with, with the higher power efficiency, it, it gives them a huge advantage over the linear regulators. The disadvantage to the switcher is they can be demanding in layout. Um, even when they are laid out correctly, because of the fast switching and because of the high current, they, uh, they're noisy. They can radiate noise, and so we have to be aware of that. We have, to we have to be aware of where this noise is coming from. There are uh, two main types of switching power supplies. There's isolated and non-isolated. Uh, what these mean is if there's a transformer in the middle of the switching power supply. And typically, yeah. typically you're going to need a... a, a a transformer isolated switching power supply when the voltages are higher and this is for a safety reason so anything above 42 and a half volts this is pretty much a worldwide standard but here I'm showing UL requirements require this as well again this is for safety but if you don't need it so the lower voltages ones can be extremely small and many of the power components can be on the same chip as the control circuitry so that's why we find modules that have very few external components So here's three of the common non-isolateds. These would be the smaller, lower voltages. Uh, they're, they're called buck boost and buck boost. And they're, and they're uh, identified by uh, your input and output voltage requirements. If it, uh, the step-down regulator is called a buck. The, in, the input voltage is going to be higher than the output. The boost, obviously, the output's going to be higher than the input. And the buck boost uh, is going to be polarity inverting. So sometimes it's called polarity inverting. And, and so, not as common, it's called a non-isolated flyback. Sometimes by mistake they're called flyback, but without the transformer they're not flyback. You'd have to call it a non-isolated flyback. So here's a, this is the simplest circuit. Oh, this is the step-down regulator, the, the buck converter. And um, like to go, uh, first thing we'll do is identify all the key power components. The filter capacitors are, are identified as C in and C out. The power switch here is U1. That's, a, that's also uh, of the function of a series pass element. L1 is the magnetic element, in this case an inductor. And then D1 is the output rectifier. In, in this case, that's a Schottky diode, trying to keep the, the forward drop, the forward voltage drop low. And then you see there's three different topologies, but they're really created by just rearranging the switch, the rectifier, and the inductor. So by these arrangements, they're, they're slightly different, but what's happening is that the energy is being recovered from the magnetic element differently. So we're getting a boost up in voltage with the boost and a polarity inverting by just rearranging the three components. And then big words, asynchronous versus synchronous. Uh, synchronous is often called an ultra-efficient switching power supply. And uh, I mentioned forward voltage drop of the rectifier. In an efficient switching power supply, a lot of time half of the losses or even over half the losses are attributed to that rectifier. And so it's being replaced by another MOSFET. Uh, it's sometimes confusing in layout. The two, the two are doing two different things, but both of them have their own critical function. Um, the control lines that are controlling the two are often called top gate and bottom gate. They're called top FET and bottom FET. One of them is, again, the series pass element. The other one's going to be the output rectification. Uh, they're also called upper and lower sometimes. But uh, you, you will see these inspections. They'll be called synchronous or ultra-efficient. And then interleaved and multi-phased. Uh, interleaving is copying the series pass element along with the magnetics. And what this does is it... Uh, lowers the current stresses on these devices. You're able to share the input and the output filter caps, and by doing this, you're actually able to reduce the size of the output filter cap. Um, 
again, more, uh, more efficient, and, and in, in this case, it's multi-phase, but you can tell by the control lines, the control lines. And uh, what that does is it actually reduces noise and increases the efficiency all at once. Uh, you're going to see this particular one doing things like supplying the core voltage of a microprocessor. So these are the isolated topologies. These are going to be typically for the higher voltages. There's, there's six common ones that I identify here, but there's really, you know, they're inventing ones all the time for different applications. The, I, I'm showing some specific or, or some common applications, but the reality is that any of these topologies will work in any application. They just have different characteristics that make them more suited for a specific application. The flyback is the one that uh, I said late, earlier was in the TV, TV high voltage. Um, that's typically where you see the flyback or, or some, uh, some cheaper uh, computer power supplies. The forward would be the higher end uh, uh, computer PSUs. Two switch forwards, uh, again, just for higher power. You can see the power typically going up in range because each one of these topologies is better suited for that range. Any topology can be interleaved. And so uh, you, you saw they went up to 1,000 watts. When, when they're going up to 10,000 watts, that's typically the full bridge that's being interleaved. So, and, and you can interleave dozens of times. There's, there's multiple switches and multiple inductors. These things can look very complex, but the switching principles are the same as the simple ones. And so I, I like showing the simple schematics because what we learn here is just replicated on some of these more complex ones. So the isolated topologies, I'm showing the flyback and the forward. Uh, these don't look too much different, but what they're doing, really, the, the flyback is, the, is derived from the previous uh, I showed you the buck boost, the polarity inverting. Really all that's happening is the magnetic element is split and coupled and wrapped around forming a transformer. So that's the isolation. But in reality, it is, that's why it's sometimes called a flyback when it's non-isolated. Uh, the forward converter is a, is a change from the buck converter. And then all the other isolated topologies are really uh, derivations of the forward converter. More switches, higher power. Uh, more efficient at that power. And then the last two would be the half bridge and the full bridge. This, this wraps up the last six of the isolated topologies. More and more switches, um, more and more efficient for more and more power. And I just want to point, if, if you see a, an H bridge, that's not, a, that's not an abbreviation for the half bridge. That's really um, showing that you're using a full bridge. And, and the H is just really how the switches look on the schematic forming an H. So we'll get into PCB layout. Any questions so far? So uh, reference layout, critical pass in EMI, and analog circuitry. The reference layout is something that you're going to find if you have a microcontroller in a manufacturer that, that outputs those data. A, a lot of times, a reference layout is going to be used exactly. Uh, you'll be able to copy it exactly, and it'll act just like uh, the manufacturer intended to. Uh, I don't get any of those. I, I rarely ever see any data sheets at all. I'm usually searching really hard for data sheets and application notes. Um, one, one hint is when you, when you can't find them, uh, contact the manufacturer. Th they will give you uh, information that you can't always find online. So again, always reference the manufacturer's data sheet and uh, any application notes. And again, this is going to apply if you, if you have a manufacturer that has a, a, a controller or, or a, a critical device in there that's going to show you how to make it work. Many times they're not available at all. So we're going to talk about some reasons that the reference layout can't be copied. Very common. I mean, if, if, if we wouldn't have this class right here if all you had to do was copy a layout every time, right? And we'll talk about where the changes can be made and where they should not. Just some, just some quick sample reference suggested layouts. They come in all forms. Some of them are cartoonish liking, some, but they're always giving you something that the manufacturer knows is needed. Most often without enough explanation of why. Some of them are just demonstration circuits that they give you that they made work for them and may or may not even apply with your application of it. 
Your layout may not look anything like that, but that's what you get as far as PCB layout direction. So here's some of the reasons a recommended layout cannot be implemented as is. Uh, the first one is the major components are different in size and shape. I, I, I think every switcher I've ever laid out has a different size inductor and a different size rectifier than what's shown in the reference layout. And I think that's typically because the electrical engineer might be going through a uh, cost reduction analysis, or he might be just changing parts out so that he can use parts that are in his company's stock. That's the most common one, and it does change the layout quite a bit when the shape is different. You can no longer maybe make return paths the way that they were. Circuit functions omitted or added, mechanical restrictions, proximity to other components, all these things are going to affect if you can implement a recommended layout as is. Test requirements would be like ICT test points, having to put vias on every signal line and the, re the manufacturer telling you you can't. Fine pitch parts requiring thinner copper weight. If a manufacturer says this layout has to be done with two ounce copper, but you have a fine pitch part that says you have to do this with three eighths ounce copper, you're going to have to plan these current paths differently and do changes to their layout. You just want to make sure it works as well as they intended. Larger vias, many times they'll tell you to put a via here and here, and if you're forced because of, because of uh, company standards or because of reliability concerns to use a different size via, you may not have that same availability for a placement for a via. So you might be changing the layout just to get the vias in there. And of course, different number of PCB layers. That's, that's a common one. So we hope by understanding how the switcher works and where the critical power paths are, uh, we'll be able to change the layout so that these things don't affect the sensitive analog circuitry. And again, your company's design standards might even bring other, other changes in mind here, via and pad, thermal, uh, thermal reliefs, footprint sizes. All these things that your company may tell you you have to use, you might be looking at a, a layout and it'll make it literally impossible to implement it. So the most, critical, the most critical paths in a switcher layout always are the AC current loops. We need to identify them so we can plan them first. And like it says right there, these paths take priority over all others. So we're laying out the switcher for the AC current loops. When we can identify those, we can start laying out our switcher. So again, the buck converters, the simple step-down regulator, so that's, a, that's an easy one to uh, start with. Uh, the DC current loops, you know, input and output source, um, they're coming from the source and charging the, the positive terminal of CN. And then that current's being returned from the negative terminal of CN back to the source. Same as the load, it's coming from, the current is being sourced from the positive terminal of C out and being returned to the negative terminal of C out. First thing you do, you, you want to identify which, where these filter caps are in your schematic and identify them at the, as this. Because these connections here need to be made at the terminals of the, of the capacitor. You want to make them with lots of vias and low impedance. The AC current loops are going to be the power switch loop. And that, this is formed when the switch is on. So the current is flowing from the positive terminal of C in and through the series pass element, through the magnetic element, to the positive terminal of C out, and being returned from the negative terminal of C out back to the negative terminal of C in. When the switch is off, we're recovering energy that's being stored in the magnetic element. So that current loop is a different current loop, slightly. It's being sourced from the, from the inductor charging the positive terminal of C out and being returned from the negative, terminal C out, the negative terminal of C out through the output rectifier and back to the magnetic element. There's very little information showing uh, non-isolated, th th there's very little for the PCB designer, but it's really quite simple when you, when you start marking where the AC current loops are. Again, this is a single output, so it's, it's quite benign looking, but when they get complex, which they do because they're, they're tapping multiple voltages off of each of these transformers, 
you still want to identify the loops, and the, they're, they're separated in the, in the isolated form. I'm also showing an output, uh, an optocoupler to get the feedback back to the controller because, again, this is for safety reasons that you would have an isolated transformer. It's a higher voltage. So the, the output of the, of the series pass element or the switch is called the switch node. And it's, and it's commonly called SW or SW node. It's part of the forward AC current path and it carries the high amplitude voltage swings and all the switching frequencies. And that, that node in particular needs to be short as possible. It needs to be size so that carries the current that's, that's needed for the power supply, but you don't want to make it wider to compensate for a longer line. And the reason is because that line and its ability to become an antenna and radiate EMI is related to its length. So the idea with that node in particular is to make it as short as possible. In the return path, the node you really want to be aware of is the difference, the difference of the two AC loops. This applies on the non-isolated switching power supplies. The difference being because the two loops you see overlay over by the C out, and some manufacturers say you don't have to worry about those because they consider those DC voltages because the voltage is on at all times. Uh, this is kind of pro this, this this is not a safe way to view this because there's other things at play here. We don't want to treat those as DC loops. They're two independent AC loops, but the difference is in particular needs to be a short, common point, low impedance connection at CN that is very short to the, the anode of the output rectifier. It, it's going to be a common point ground that, that in uh, switchers is going to also apply to P ground and any thermal pads for your uh, controllers. And here's just a sample layout of a buck converter layout. All the, power, all the power components are on the same side of the board. They're, the connections are made without vias. And then the return paths are made with vias without thermal relief. The output rectifier is always placed very close to the, to the magnetic element. Excuse me, and the return path to, to uh, C in as well. That's our switch node that's... Uh, made as small as possible. So the AC return paths should match the forward paths as much as possible. And the best way to do that is with a full ground plane on layer two, right underneath your, your switching power supply. It's pretty much universally recommended that you have a full ground plane underneath your switching power supply, unless you're doing a one layer board. And, and then then you really have to think about this, how you're going to get the return loop paths shortened and small. The reason for this is that the magnetic fields, when close, cancel each other out. So this reduces EMI. So the switch node in particular, need, because it's, it carries the, the, the switching and the high current path, it needs to be protected and, and needs to be located in a way that it's not near any other circuitry or any other switchers. This particular layout is a, is a buck converter, but there's something missing. The rectifier is on board. This is an ultra-efficient ultra synchronous rectifier. So you don't see the rectifier, but when the connections come out to the PC board, they follow the same rules as when it's outside. So that's, enough, that's it on the high current paths. Was there, was there any questions on that? I'd be happy to move forward then. So the duty cycle control is what determines the output voltage. And this signal is going to carry the, the switching frequency. It, it's also considered medium current. And 
should be protected from the AC high power paths as much as possible. And because it's medium current and carries the switching, the switching frequency, it needs, to be protect, it needs to be away from any sensitive analog circuitry that it could affect. You, spend, you might spend a lot of time working on these gate lines right after you plan your AC current loops. And then one form of dirty, duty control is pulse width modulation. Uh, just changes the time that the switch is on and off in variation to, to the uh, variation of the input voltage. The area of each block is the same, and this just helps provide a really stable output voltage. So to make the duty cycle work correctly, we need some kind of feedback. I'm sorry, this is a duty cycle again, I'm sorry. Um, this is a gate driver as opposed to uh, an integrated controller. And these signals many times have to be routed as a pair and routed internally. Again, this is to, close, this is to contain the loop, make the loop as small as possible to reduce EMI, and, and also provide common mode noise rejection. This is, this is what you're going to see when you start building switchers out of discrete components as opposed to getting controllers to do it for you. And to get an accurate duty cycle, we need some type of feedback from the output, either voltage or current. So many times it's voltage, and many times it's done with a voltage divider, just sensing the output voltage. And then it's going to uh, feed into an analog error correcting amplifier. And this, this is going to be on a controller chip. Uh, this, it's commonly called the FB, or feedback node. And that node, in particular, is high impedance, which means it's sensitive to noise. The other type of feedback might be a current feedback. How much current is the, is the uh, power supply supplying at any given time, dynamically? And it, that's done through a, a, a sense resistor and a comparator that senses the voltage drop across the known resistor. With that, they can calculate how much current is going through that, that resistor at any time. You can see th these aren't things that you're going to see an auto router do. Uh, the net classes are of high current, yet they turn for a short period of time into analog signals. They'd have to be treated as a differential pair. Noise immunity is what you're after here, and the routing of that is pretty specific. It's called a Kelvin connection. Many times you might need to ground shield it, depending on what's around it. This will be another uh, example of a Kelvin connection. Uh, this was the uh, the synchronous buck converter that you're going the, the uh, multi-phase synchronous buck converter you're going to see supplying your microprocessors, your core voltages and such. And just real quick, you can see in the middle there is two CNs. Your two switch, your two series pass elements, then two rectifiers, two inductors, and then two sense resistors. And you can see the V is coming from the middle of them, and then C out coming back. Analog ground plane in the middle. The next slide will be the bottom side view. You can see the controller picking up the Kelvin connections from the two sense resistors, and then providing the duty cycle back to the series pass element. So these analog signals, the uh, feedbacks that we're talking about, the uh, Kelvins and, and specifically the voltage divider networks, they're analog and they, they need to be not corrupted by the high current paths. And so for that reason, many times you have to have an analog ground plane for them to reference. So the, and typically you're going to have a common point to tie that analog ground plane back to some point in the switcher. C out is a common place for it, but uh, manufacturers will show you many, many times how the, how the component is laid out internally will dictate a different place for this common point. They said here's another spot for it. I mean, this is a common point dictated by the uh, manufacturer. Uh, analog circuitry down at the bottom, 
Uh, S ground stands for signal ground, but that, in this case, that is an analog ground. That's what S ground stands for. So when you identify that in the common point from S ground to P ground, you're going to know where, the, currents, where the, the high current returns are and where to stay away from. The idea of anything coming in, the, the analog signals that are coming into the analog area of this uh, controller should optimally cross in at the common point. Thermals, always a big issue with switchers. Switchers are not 100% efficient, so they are losing some power to heat. And because we make them so small, that heat is often hard to get out. This one obviously isn't too small. This is, a, uh, this is an inverter for a solar panel. So uh, there's a lot of heat because it's outside in the sun already. We're trying to extract the heat. And we have a heat sink on the back side. In reality, we would like to shorten the gate and the control lines. But what we have here is we want to use the low impedance DC voltages for all the heat sinks. We want to use the V in, the V out, and ground. What you don't want to use is the switch node. And, and what often happens is switch node is actually the best mechanical way to get heat out of a switcher. But that's your radiating EMI antenna that you want to reduce at all, at all costs. And of course, another way of getting heat out is the airflow. They're, they're tightly packed in tall components all the time. And your switcher itself is going to have tall components. It's going to have a tall inductor and tall filter caps. And it may be shadowing your, you may be shadowing your series pass element, your, your, your switch itself. Which is where you're trying to get the heat out of. If you're using just airflow, you really need to know the air direction. You, really you might be rotating the switcher just for heat extraction. Another form you see them in laptops is thermal conduction. We make contact to the components to extract the heat. In this case, we have a, a backside conductive cooling element that contact and on top as well. But many times this is mechanically done. It might be done from a previous product. It might be done because the mechanical gets to do it first. But uh, this is an example of pre-placed components. So in layout, we don't like pre-placed components because it, it gives us very little leeway on how we're going to lay it out. So when you're forced to do it this way, and you're forced to do the switcher to where it works well, you may end up with, with, with a placement that's far denser in certain areas than others. So let's go to some common do's and don'ts, some layout mistakes. Uh, also, we need to be creative in coming up with some, some solutions so that we don't implement mistakes just because we're being forced one direction with our layout. So don't. A lot of times we're given stack ups that we're forced to use. This is a flight aerospace HGI stack up. We're not going to change that and get this layout out this year. So we have to make this work for us. But as you can see, the return path for our AC current loops are in layer 5. We have some high-speed signals on 3 and 4. And if we didn't plan this, we could be routing those signals right through our AC current loops in our switcher. Just being aware of this is going to force you to make sure this does not happen. If you let this go, this is an easy mistake to make. Route right through it, right? So what I suggest is possibly using multiple layers and having them well stitched together. You can either bring the return path closer to the forward return or vice versa. The advantage of bringing the forward current back down to the return current is that you're widening the copper. You do have to well stitch it together, but it increases your current capability and it, your ambient temperature rise is lowered. Don't place the voltage sense components where they're sensing. This is a common mistake. You'd be surprised. Uh, here we have the high impedance feedback trace wrapping around right past the switch node. It's going to be very difficult to get an accurate reading of what's really happening on the output of the switcher. It's going to be noise induced on that. We basically are making a big antenna for pickup. So what we want to do is place them 
as close as possible to that feedback node. You'll see that in switchers a lot, the, the term ACAP, as close as possible. And then you bring the DC voltage as a trace back. That one's benign and, and immune to noise. Here's our current sense, our Kelvin connections. Many times I showed you a layout where the Kelvin connections must be made with vias. If at all possible, we, we, we try not to make them with vias. The Kelvin connections made the same way. But if vias are needed, well, they're sensing power connections, right? So those nets, by definition, are already plane nets probably in, in your layout. And so they very easily could be shorted right to the plane and not allowing you to get a, a, an accurate reading across what's happening across our sense. So we use our CAD tool to make sure that the, those vias do not get shorted to the plane where we don't want them to. You know, we, we, there's several ways to do that. I, I like drawing small little circle voids, but I like to document this. So in case there's a further revision of this layout, at some future point in time, these aren't just little pieces of uh, draws that get floated around and, and affect other circuitry. Got to be aware of where our switching noise is in the switcher so that it doesn't affect other circuitry. We don't want it near anything sensitive, and we don't want it near other circuits, uh, other switchers. This case right here is a couple, a couple don'ts. We have the two transformer, the two inductors next to each other, and they're coupling and causing. This is a transformer now. We have noise induced from one into the other. So that's a couple don'ts right there. And what you, do, what I do suggest doing is the first thing on a layout I like to do is have working placements of all the switchers. When you do that, you know where the switch nodes are, you know where to face them, and you know how to keep them away from anything else that's, that's going to be sensitive. Other people may start with other circuits, but I always start with the switchers first. This one might be the worst mistake of all, uh, placing C out at the load. Uh, a lot of the, if you're using multiple series pass elements, C out size often decreases in size. So it becomes a small ceramic cap. And if you don't have it identified early as C out, it could easily get mistaken for a missing bypass cap at a device somewhere else on the board. And what you've done here is you've, you've taken away the ability to filter out the voltage ripple at the output. And what happens here, the simple little mistake, but you will have the voltage ripple across all your, your, your plane in between here, and you will see it on all your signals on that voltage rail. All your digital outputs will see that switching frequency on it. So what do you do with C out? You put it right next to the magnetic element that's forming the LC filter. Switchers do give off heat. I said they aren't 100% efficient. That power loss is output as heat. So at that phase, when you're first laying out your switcher and you're getting a placement you can work with, plan how you're going to get the thermal out of it. Thermal V is in the exposed pad of the controller. Flooding with all your DC voltages. Planning airflow direction, all these things. Thermal vias, have, I've, heard, I've heard them defined as something uh, being a 14 mil or larger via. Um, of course, you can use smaller vias. Sometimes you have to, especially when they're in pad. Uh, but they seem to work the best for thermal extraction, a 14 mil via. So obviously, knowing how these current paths are and where the analog circuitry is going to allow us to lay out a switcher in the best possible way, when we, especially when we have to change how that layout is. Some of these issues that I've said, they aren't as critical. And so this gets confusing because some people don't care on certain switchers. Well, they, these issues increase when, you, when the current goes up and when the switching frequency goes up. And I guess that's what I'm saying there, that each application is unique. I have a power supply review course. It's not really uh, apropos, but it does explain some of the, why we call AC voltage or AC current return. Uh, I said forward AC current, which sounds, uh, which sounds wrong because everyone thinks 
AC current only goes one, or it goes uh, two different polarities, alternating current. Alternating current can also have a square waveform, but by definition, it supplies a cycl cyclically varying voltage over time. And what we know is that it's not a DC current, because DC current has a uniform direction of flow and amount, or voltage, of electricity. So the one thing we know is not a DC voltage. And a, DC, and a DC voltage that's switched on and off rapidly, as in a switcher, is a cyclically varying voltage over time. It's either positive or negative relative to where it was just a second ago. And regulation is necessary because the input voltages are not perfect. And today's processors working at sub one volt uh, require really stable output regulation. Switchers can do that if they're, if they're laid out correctly. That's why linear regulators are so inefficient. It's because all the loss goes to heat. They need headroom. 60% uh, efficient is, is common for a linear regulator. That means all that heat is, is it, all that power is lost to heat. Common application would be a 12 volt regulator outputting a 5 volt output. If it's got one amp that it's outputting, that's 7 volt drop across it, and it's, it's 7 watts of heat that you must extract from that. That's a pretty common application, but 7 watts is, is killer in the wrong environment. And this is why switching power supplies are more efficient. They're turning it on and off, and your output voltage is really just a voltage average. The rise and fall, the switching is, is well, for pulse width modulation, the, the uh, rise and fall times are going to change. But typical frequencies are going to be, it, it depends what you're doing. I mean, we can see, you know, uh, pulse width modulation happens at a very slow speed sometimes. But kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz is, is for a, uh, like a high-powered audio transformer. But you could also get into the megahertz. It's not tens or hundreds of megahertz, but it is a hard, fast switching signal that you do have to worry about the harmonics of the, of the edges. So it's less of the rise and fall time, but really about the hard edges. Yeah, that, it's a, it, the switching power supply doesn't really handle that. I mean, it handles a pulse width modulation for the input voltage, but there has to be an EMI filter, right. rectification. All that happens before the switcher. So the switcher really isn't there to take care of that. Uh, now, there, uh, in the main power supply of a computer, they had something called power factor correcting. And that helps because it's boosting up the voltage to pre, um, to, to uh, it, it's a, like a preamp for the, for the, uh, for the main power supply. Yeah, yeah but, sw but switchers aren't typically just plugged into the wall. You know, they, ha they, they, have, they have filtering and, and prepping before they get the voltage itself. I want to thank you all. If there's any other questions or anything else I could help with, I, I'm more than happy. I'm going to be at the... Uh, the exhibition tomorrow, Optimum Design has a, has a tent over there. Uh, please feel free to stop by and talk, and, and I'd love to talk about your layouts. Um, please do that. All right? Have fun with your layouts and contact me anytime. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much.